Johnny, we hail. And now, another proudly we hail. One of radio's outstanding dramatic half hours, starring Lee Tracy, and presented transcribed by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your star and host on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished Broadway stage, screen, and radio star, Lee Tracy. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart, and hello, everyone. Welcome again to Proudly We Hail. To the Orient for our story, eh, Lee? That's right, Ken, to the fabulous East Indies. For a story about a sea captain, his men, and his ship, a beautiful lady, and several characters you'd hate to meet on a dark night. It's a tale guaranteed to keep you on the edge of your seat. We'll be ready for the first act after your message, Ken. You young men who graduated from high school this year, there's a chance for you to get ahead fast in our great Air Force. Air Force enlistments have been restricted for a long time, but they're open again now. And remember, the sky's the limit in the United States Air Force. Visit your United States Air Force recruiting station today. Get all the details. And now with your star, Lee Tracy, in the role of Captain Peter Lynn, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production of Port of Call, Jakarta. <laughs> This is a story about a man named Peter Lynn, who was owner and master of the schooner Albatross. Our tale is taken from the remarkable journal he kept back in the days before the advent of the steamship, when every vessel wore her canvas proudly. Helmsman, how does she read now? No, by no west, sir. Keep her at that. Aye, sir. If this wind holds, Mr. Bowen, we'll weather bank her by daybreak. Wind or no wind, Captain, we could show our stern to anything that's spangless and after us. Your optimism is fine, Mr. Bowen, but your logic is off course. If the wind veers, let me know. I'll look in on our passenger for a moment. She's your ship. Hi, Captain. Begging your pardon, sir, but ain't he the one? He's the one, all right, Cross. Forcing his royal nibs into the water the way he did. Why, the crew's still fit to bust. Perishing sight it was. Strange indeed are the tricks of fate. Or perhaps they are not tricks at all, but rather the guiding finger of the Almighty. How far and how fast the news will travel, there's no telling. Well, no matter, the thing is done, there can be no regret. But it's amusing to think that had we not sailed into Jakarta three days past, None of it would have ever occurred. The crew's eager for a night ashore, sir. Well, they deserve it, Mr. Bowen. Starboard watch is free tonight, port tomorrow. Uh, tell Croft, if he lands in jail, we sail without him. Aye, aye, yes, I will. Uh, she rides light and free with the cargo out of her. We'll be taking on a new consignment in the morning. The English people like the way we work. I think we've a steady contract there as long as we want it. Uh, good course to celebrate, Captain. Mr. Mate, we've sailed together for long enough for me to be able to read the thirsty look in your eye. Go ashore with the starboard watch, if you like. Yeah, but what about you, sir? I'll stay aboard. Albatross is woman and drink enough for me. What is it, O'Brien? Uh, sir, it is two things I got to me credit. It's me nose and me eyes. Since far noon, when we were busy at the unloading, I've been see, both seeing and smelling things that I, I thought should be brought to your notice. You don't say, O'Brien. Now, what are these mysterious things you've been seeing and smelling? Uh, look here, sir. What do you see standing by the quayside? You mean that black carriage? Exactly, sir. Now, oh, I... O'Brien, have you been at the bottle? Sir, not since we left that dirty hole at Simba. Have I so much as... That'll do, O'Brien. Now, what about that carriage? Four times have I seen it come and go since I first noticed it. You can't see who's in it, in the top pulled down as it is, and not once has anyone stepped out of it. It just pulls up there and stands for a while, nothing moving, and then off it goes. And a bit later, back it comes. 
just irregular, I calls it, sir. And this has been going on since... Uh... Since just after six bells, sir. Uh, thank you, O'Brien. As you say, your eyes and nose do your credit. But I'll say your curiosity is larger than both. Aye, sir. I just thought you might like to be more. Well, what do you make of it, Mr. Bourne? You charge it, Joe, Captain. Well, probably nothing at all. Then again, I've always found it a good idea when possible to get an answer to the mysteries of life. We're not known here. I'll take a couple of men and look into it. Ah, that won't be necessary, Mr. Bowen. I'll see to this myself. Take command. Is there something that you... Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. (laughs) Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Captain Lynn of the ship in which you seem to have some interest. (laughs) Or am I wrong? How do you do, Captain? Well, I do hope you don't think that I... I seem to have startled you, madam. Forgive me. Is there any way in which I can be of service? Will you... You sail for Singapore soon? That's right. But may I ask how... How soon? Two or three days, all depending... Would you take a passenger? A passenger, madam? What passenger? Myself. Well, would it not be better, madam, to go by regular ship? I have no accommodations, especially... Oh, no, no, for... please. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't explain. I heard from a friend that that's where you're bound, and I desperately want to go there. I must go there. You're in trouble, madam? Oh, no, no. I... Well, I mean... Please don't ask these questions. Since this morning, I've been trying to get up enough courage to speak to you. I can say anything you ask within reason. May I ask what there is in Singapore that's so pressing? Friends. Blessed friends. And here there are none? None. Only people to spy on me. I see. Is it right to say that in taking you there'd be a certain amount of risk involved? Oh, only if he... Well, if you took me and no one knew of it, there would be no risk. But the chances of someone not knowing it would be rather slim, huh? I don't know. I have no right to ask you that... Yes, there would be a risk, a terrible risk. It's only right, madam, that if I must take such risk, I know from where it comes. I'm responsible to my crew and my ship. There's no time to talk now. I was just leaving when you came. Could I meet you here tomorrow night, say, say 9 o'clock? I'll tell you everything, then. If you like, I can meet you where it's more convenient. No, no, this will be convenient. As you wish, madam. Right now, I can promise you nothing. I understand. Thank you for listening to me, Captain. Until tomorrow night. Good evening, madam. And that was the beginning of it. A beautiful woman dressed in the heights of fashion with hands that darted nervously, a voice that trembled with fear and whose brown, fawn-like eyes were haunted and terror-ridden. I had an instinctive desire to help her, but I knew hard logic must man the helm. I would in no way endanger my crew or my ship for all the beautiful women from here to Atlantis. It was the following afternoon that a visitor came aboard. Mr. Bowen brought him aft where I sat smoking a pipe with a fantail, looking out over the ship's cluttered harbor. I beg your pardon, Captain. There's a gentleman here who would like to have a word with you. Ah? Uh, uh, Captain Lynn, uh, my name is Riker, uh, Edgar Riker. How do you do, Mr. Riker? Won't you sit down? Oh, I thank you. You can dismiss the port watch, Mr. Bowen. They're to be aboard by four bells. Hey, Captain. And now, sir. Oh, she's a fine ship. As fine as I've ever seen. Kind of you to say so. Your next port of call is Singapore, is that correct? I didn't know it was public knowledge. (laughs) Such information has a way of getting around, Captain. Suppose you tell me the nature of your business, Mr. Riker. Certainly. It is simply that I should like to buy your ship. I'm prepared to offer you double whatever you paid for it. You want, you want to buy the Albatross? Oh, let's understand each other right now. This, this ship is not for sale at any price. And may I ask how you knew I was her owner, not just her captain? <laughs> I didn't. I merely surmised and you verified my supposition. Well, you can't blame me for wanting to buy her now, can you? No, Mr. Riker, I can't, but... I can assure you that nothing you or any man on this earth could offer would ever make me consider selling. But then I'll take no more of your time, Captain. It's been a pleasure. I'll find my way to the dock. Uh, until we meet again. Good evening, Mr. Riker. <laughs> Pleasant sailing, Captain. 
Of all the impertinent... Uh... Mr. Bowen, will you come aft? Aye, sir. Anything you miss, Captain? You know that slippery little eel said he wanted to buy the albatross? Buy the... <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Good one indeed. I'll bet he had no more intention of buying her than he had of swimming from here to Macassar. I, I don't follow your course, sir. He, if he said... Never mind what he said, Mr. Bowen. Just remember him, and if you should see him hanging around again, let me know. I could put one of the lads onto him, sir, if you say the word. Ah, oh, that won't be necessary. Just keep a weather eye. He smelled of trouble from stem to stern. I was to meet the woman of yesterday at 9 o'clock, and due to natural curiosity, I looked forward to our meeting with some impatience. Yet I could not shake from my mind the incident with Riker, his lean, serpentine face with its hooded, mocking eyes, flicked through my brain while his oily voice wove an unpleasant counterpart around my thoughts. There was nothing uncommon in anyone wanting to buy the albatross or to pay double. It was, after all, a credit to her, but Riker's manner and then my growing belief that he did not really wish to buy her at all had me filled with a cold anger. At two bells, I went on deck. Leaving the ship in Mr. Bowen's hands, I stepped ashore, made my way toward the carriage that stood waiting on the quayside. Madam, I... <laughs> I always seem to be surprising you, Captain. Don't make a move. I assure you, if necessary, I won't hesitate to blow your head off. Get up with you, quickly. What the devil do you think you're doing? Ordering you to get up here, Captain, and get up here fast. It might interest you to know my first mate is watching us. And he happens to think this is quite a different kind of meeting. And when we drive off, he'll smile and figure his captain's not such a fool after all. Now climb aboard. He had me, and I knew it. I knew also he wouldn't hesitate to shoot if I didn't obey. Aside from that, there was a native driver who stared down at me unmoving, a large knife gripped in his hand. I did the only thing I could, climbed up into the carriage next to Riker, and in a moment we were off, heading into the city, and I knew not what. <laughs> Lee Tracy, starring in the role of Captain Peter Lynn in the proudly we hail production of Port of Call, Jakarta, will return in just a moment for the second act. The United States Air Force has a good deal for veterans. Just listen to this. The Air Force is growing so fast, it needs men already trained to take over many important new jobs. Here are the facts. If you're a veteran of any service, and if you have the training the Air Force needs, you can enlist now if qualified, in your old grade or better. You'll skip basic training and be assigned at once to a nearby Air Force base. You'll start right in doing the kind of work you know how to do well, the kind you like to do. And you'll be helping to build the greatest flying team in the world. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Have a talk with the recruiting sergeant and learn all the facts. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now with your star, Lee Tracy, in the role of Captain Peter Lynn, we present the second act of Port of Call, Jakarta. We rode in silence, twisting and turning through streets little better than alleyways, and came at last upon a long, sloping hill that turned sharply into a drive. Mr. Riker did not take his eyes or his gun off me from start to finish. The drive we entered was long and hemmed in by floral growth. It swept gradually inward. As the carriage slowed, I caught a dark glimpse of a dwelling, knew the journey was over. You may get down, Captain. Riker, what the devil took you so long? Sorry, sir, everything's in order. Bring that fancy pants filled rat in here. After you, Captain. With Riker's gun prodding me in the back, I walked toward the open doorway and the raging character who stood framed within it. He was round and squat and bald, a toad of a man, almost as wide as he was tall. By the flickering torches that stood out like gaffs on either side of the entrance, 
I saw the wild light of madness reflected in his bulging eyes. Take him in the den. To your right, Captain. Sit down. He'll be right back. I'll stand. Would you mind telling me what the mean is of all this? Patience, Captain, patience. I think you'd better sit down. If you think that you... Now, you conniving wench. Is this the man? No. Is it? No, let go of me. I've had enough of your lies, you... When he struck her, there was no more reason left in me. I dove for him and had my fingers clenched about his throat when a blinding light exploded in my brain and I dropped sickeningly into the darkness. Coming around, sir. Prop him up in that chair. And if he makes another move, don't use the butt. Up to this. Ah, he weighs a ton. No uh, uh, more water in his face. Uh, uh, what? Oh, what? What's going on here? <laughs> Always <laughs> asking questions. Shut up. <laughs> Mister, are you able to hear me? My name is Captain Lynn. Your fancy quarter-deck airs won't do you any good here. Repeat your rashness of a short time ago, and you'll feed the fishes. If you have any intelligence at all, you must by now have some inkling of why I had you brought here. That, that woman you saw earlier is my good wife. Then may God have mercy on her. You need to be taught a lesson. Maybe one way to teach you to keep a civil tongue in your head is to have it removed. My wife made arrangements with you to take her to Singapore. Is that correct? It is not, you fat pig. When you address Mr. Spengler, address him with respect. Thank you, Riker. It'll do you no good to lie. Riker saw you meet. You're bound for Singapore. But Noah has friends there who would help her get back to England. It's obvious that you agreed to take her here. Is that not so? Go to the devil, Anderson. you stinking squid. No, don't hit him, Riker. Not yet. The more he says, the more of a lesson he'll be taught. Is there anything else on your mind, mister? If it's ever in my power to help the poor woman who happens to be your wife, I'll do it. I'll take her to Singapore. I'll take her to Calcutta or London. Anywhere she wants to get out of your reach. <laughs> you were right, Riker. A gentleman. He said you were a gentleman. Did you think he really wanted to buy your ship? I had only to look at him to know that he wouldn't have the money to buy a pound of salt cod. Very good. Such an astute judge of character. Did you hear, Riker? I heard. And I'll remember with advantages. All right, enough of this. After Riker is done with you, he can take you back to your ship. I'll let you crawl as he pleases. The lesson he is going to teach you is so that you remember if ever again you are foolish enough to sail into Jakarta, you respect and fear the name of Spengler. Now it's my turn to laugh. Riker will change that. The moral of this might be, never agree to take a strange woman to Singapore, especially when she's my wife. I bid you goodbye and good riddance, fool. Well, 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 just the two of us, Captain. And between us, this gun and this knife. Now, if I'm forced to kill you, Mr. Spengler will have no regrets at all. So let me caution you, don't move. Don't even move your head. Riker, don't underestimate me. Oh, I uh don't, Captain, I don't. Now, just put your hands behind that chair, easy-like. I always teach a better lesson when the student sits still. Would you I... like to be a rich man, Riker? Ha, ah, bribery. How rich could you make me, Captain? You can see for yourself. I can? How? Around my neck there's a silver chain. It holds a small bag that's under my shirt. If you have a look inside, you'll see what I mean. Tell me what you mean. I don't like to be kept in suspense. Pearls. Ah, pearls. In that case, we better have a look. I wanted him in front of me, close to me. The lure had worked. Now I had only to hook my fish. His knife flicked out and cut my shirt. He parted the sides with its point. There was a fixed grin on his face as it touched the pouch lying against my chest. 
His eyes flicked downward at it, and I struck. <laughs> I made short work of Mr. Riker as I flung him across the room. His limp body crashed through the window, and I knew I had no fear of any interference from that quarter. I picked up his gun and prepared to go hunting. still want to go to Singapore? Oh, you, you can't get out of here. They'll kill you. If you want me to take you, you'll have to help. You'll have to get hold of yourself. No, they'll catch me. If you got home safely to England, how could he touch you? He, he couldn't. My parents... All were... right. Get up off the bed. I can't. He's tied here. Tied? You're dirty. Hold still. Now listen. Is there anybody else to help him besides Riker? Well, the servants, but they must all be in bed. Could you get a carriage ready without attracting their attention? I think so. The stalls are in the back, and the dogs won't bother me. Then get whatever you need and get it quickly. I'll bring it down when I'm through with him. Oh. Are you going to kill him? Would you like me to, madam? No. No, I'd like to have the pleasure of doing that myself. I watched Lenore Spangler disappear down the wide, curving staircase. Then I turned my attention to her husband's room. As might be expected, his door was locked. So without further delay, I shot the lock off and kicked open the door. Oh, what the devil? Right away! Now, you wart, I'll teach the lesson. The lesson is never lay a hand on Peter Lynn unless you're willing to pay the price, which is this. I hear your clothes. Get into them, and I'll continue the lesson. Get up, you slobbering octopus. Get up before I kill you, as I most certainly should. How much farther, Miss Spangler? Only a little way. Please be careful that he doesn't try any tricks. Ah, oh, no fear, madam. Drive the carriage, and I'll entertain your husband. You'll pay for this, you... Mind your language. Mr. Bowen! Ahoy, Mr. Bowen! Yes, sir! Come to the carriage! All right, now get down, live. Wait a moment, madam. My mate will aid you. <laughs> Mr. Bowen, see to the lady here. There's luggage in the rear. Hey, Captain. Uh, foul weather, sir? A uh, touch, but the wind changed. Move, you fat-bellied pirate. Oh, I was getting a mite worried, sir. Good of you, Mr. Bowen, but no need. Is the port watch aboard? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Croft? Uh, well, in a manner we're speaking, sir. Good. As soon as you've shown Mrs. Spengler to my cabin, rouse all hands. We sail at once. At once, Captain. Uh, uh, watch your step, madam. Down the gangway, Spengler. You can't kidnap me. Move! Oh. Mrs. Spengler, is there anything you'd like to say to your husband before we cast off? Yes, thank you. Otto, I'm going home to England. If you follow me there, my brothers and my father will be waiting. May God have pity on you for the brute that you are. Lenore! Stay where you are! Well, hands on deck! You think you can get away with this? I'll hunt you down. I'll follow you no matter where you go. I've full fast ships at my command. You'll never escape me for this. No sea. Save your breath. You'll need it. Ready, Mr. Bourne, take the helm. Aye, sir. Stand by to cast off. Cast off forward. Stand by your jib and mizzen halyards. Fall away smartly. Cast off stern. Back to jib. Watch your helm, Mr. Yeah, Bowen. Yeah. All right, now. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. Now, sir, tell me, can you swim? You've reckoned with the wrong man. I You're... said, can you swim? What the devil if I can? Well, here's your chance to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get you. I'll get you. <laughs> Belay there, Sam. 
stand by the main halyard. Make sail! The tide was on the ebb and drew us strongly toward the open sea. The albatross shook herself and welcomed the wind. Its clean bite filled her taut canvas. She heeled smoothly to its force, cutting sharply through the beckoning swells. For better or for worse, with our cargo battened under hatches and a beautiful woman aboard, we were underway, racing the dawn, bound for Singapore. Our star, Lee Tracy, will return in a moment with a word about next week's show. Here is good news for you young men who graduated from high school in the class of 51. You have a chance to join the world's greatest flying team, the United States Air Force. Air Force enlistments have been restricted for a long time, but they're open again now, and many of you bright young Americans will find a good job in the Air Force. Here are the facts. You'll take an aptitude test so the Air Force can find out what kind of job you're best fitted to do, whether it's in radio, radar, mechanics, meteorology, or many other fields. You'll get wonderful training. Perhaps you'll attend a technical school and continue your education. And because our Air Force is growing so fast, there are plenty of chances to get ahead. The sky's the limit. So don't worry about what you'll do now that you've finished high school. You'll find the answer to that all-important question at your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. Proudly we hail stars Lee Tracy. Port of Call, Jakarta was written by DeWitt Cup. The music was composed and conducted by John Guarneri. This program was produced under the supervision of Charles and Rogers Productions and directed by Charles Wilkes. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here again is your host and star, Lee Tracy. Join us next week over the same station for Proudly We Hail, won't you? Our play is entitled Nightmare, and it's a tale of suspense. A story of a frightened man facing a frightening decision. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>